We have already had a blockbuster trade go down in the NFL, and we are getting ready for what could be really an amazing offseason of player movement, some big-time names that could be free agents. Let's just get rid of that franchise tag, okay, and uh, and let these guys go to other teams so we have more to talk about this offseason. Welcome to the show. It's Fantasy Football Today on Tuesday, February 2nd. Adam Azer with Dave Richard, and we'll say hello to Heath Cummings, who is live, you know, in podcast world live, from Tampa, Covering Super Bowl 55. Hello, Heath. Uh, hi, Adam. Hi. How is Tampa? Uh, he sounds it live. Is, it is really fantastic. Uh, beautiful. One of my favorite cities in all of Florida. Beautiful place. Um, currently, I believe it's 49 degrees with a 20 mile an hour wind. No. And, oh um, you know, it's good to get the seasons because we don't get a lot of seasons in South Florida. So, I am as soon as we finish this up, I'll be uh, heading over to the stadium to discuss Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes Super Bowl props. Lots of very interesting props. Excellent. And I guess the one question unrelated to the Super Bowl, but related to Tampa is where have you picked up craft beer from in the area? Because I know that there's a lot of breweries there that you love. My um, I had to get a suite to make room for the uh, Cigar City. Um, but there is, uh, some space Pope and some fancy papers and some bubbleometer and some high low. Um, yeah. So are you actually able to go do things? No. Yeah. You're just in the hotel and, and at the stadium, right? I am in the hotel and at the stadium and, and in the hotel and at the stadium. And if you want to go for a walk in this fantastic wintry weather, you're, I, I do that as well. Are you, do you, have you turned on the news? Do you know, I have a foot and a half of snow outside. Okay. Like 49. But how would that, like, that's the thing. I understand that there's like real winter happening in other places. I don't really care if it's happening near you because I'm not sure how you would ever know. Yeah. Like, like is it's, it snowing it's a good in thing your the house? Super Bowl isn't in New York. There's snow in my garbage can, which I, you know, I took out the garbage. They took it. And then now, and then a bunch of snow got in there. So that's, I got to deal with that. Heath, you want to, uh. To get snow out of my garbage. Now, can. now, like, now, I feel bad. Adam has snow in his garbage. Actually, can. we did take the kids outside in the snow yesterday, so I'm actually glad that there's all this snow. I hope everybody uh, is safe, didn't lose power, all that stuff, and I hope you're ready to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, free agency. Uh, first question, Dave, how loaded is this free agent class? It's pretty loaded, uh, and it's it's interesting because I believe the NFL draft class is also loaded. So teams are going to have to make some really tough decisions about how they go about their offseason. And I wonder if because the draft class being loaded means that veterans that are free agents might not get the type of money that they're looking for, especially because the salary cap situation usually every year goes up and up and up. Everybody knows about what's happened to the NFL this year and how their revenue has taken a big hit, the cap. Figures to go down, it might be flat year over year, meaning it doesn't go up or down, but it's it's not going to be a great situation for the majority of the players. If you're really good, you'll get the franchise tag. The teams will figure out a way to, to store that cap space. But I, this is going to be an interesting time just to see how many huge contracts get done versus how many veterans have to end up taking like, I don't know, like a short one-year deal. So there might be some really good players that have to settle for less than ideal money. Heath, who is the biggest name or names that you could see changing teams this offseason? You know, I, I was thinking about this. We were, I was talking to Jamie actually yesterday, and there were two things. Like with the wide receivers, there's obviously a handful of superstar or at least star wide receivers that are going to be star wide receivers next year. And I think the question is, which of those guys, if any of them, change teams? And the, like the most obvious one I think that likely does is Allen Robinson. So if I had to bet on who is the biggest name that changes teams, I think I'd set the bar at Allen Robinson. Um, I do think Chris Godwin is, is more possible maybe than it, than uh, I've heard people speculate on just because Tampa Bay has so many free agents and Antonio Brown and Gronk are both Brady's friends. And I don't know if Godwin is quite a super friend yet. Um, but then the running backs also like, there's five starting fantasy running backs that are free agents. And I'm not sure that any of them besides Aaron Jones get feature roles. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, if you heard fantasy football today in five, we did run through the list, but 
There's free agents, Aaron Jones, Chris Carson, Kenyon Drake, James Connor, Jeff Wilson actually signed a one-year deal with the Niners, so he's off the market. Leonard Fournette is a free agent to be Philip Lindsay, uh, restricted Gus, Ed- yeah, et cetera. Todd Gurley, Todd Gurley yeah. Um, and then, but there's also salary ca- salary cap casualties, possible salary cap casualties. David Johnson, mate, Dave's got Ezekiel Elliott in this article that he wrote about a month ago. Um, that would be that would be eye opening. Um, Melvin Gordon could be a cap casualty. Raheem Mostert, uh, but the wide receiver is really where it's at. And also, of course, there are trades and Deshaun Watson. Ho- I hope he gets traded. I think that'd be fun if he got traded. Man, give us give us a fun bonus podcast. Just try to get traded like mid afternoon, you know, not at like ten p.m. Yeah, don't do what the Rams did. Yeah. Um. All right. So, yeah. Ezekiel Elliott has more money dead if he's cut than if he's on the team. It depends on the timing of the cut, and it really. I I think his contract is already guaranteed for twenty twenty one, and the decision that the Cowboys have is whether or not they want to guarantee his twenty twenty two salary. And they have to decide that within like the first few days of the league new year in March. My, my guess is that he stays with the Cowboys. Uh, so give me your, your favorite combination of free agent or trade or cap casualty, whatever it is, your favorite combination of team and or of player going to a new team. Uh, Dave, you want to start? Does Deshaun Watson count in this? Absolutely. And how off the reservation can I be? Do I have to be realistic or can I be like, just, just send him to the giants. I, I, I don't know. That's what you want. You want to have a 30 minute podcast about what Deshaun Watson would do Let's to the go. giants. We got offense. Chris Godwin, Deshaun Watson. Yeah, Adam, yeah. You just, yeah, bring it. Tons of money. All right. It's unrealistic, but if the Cowboys wanted to just totally stab Dak Prescott in the back, they could give up a ton to get Deshaun Watson. And then Deshaun Watson's throwing to lamb Cooper, uh, and, and the rest of that group in, in Big D. I think that would be phenomenal. I have a question. Yeah, no, that's is, a dream. It's like a dream first, scenario. Two, two questions. Ethan in the back. First, I don't know why the Cowboys would do that when they could just pay Dak Prescott. Because Watson keep is better all of than their Prescott. draft picks. And two, I don't know why we'd want that for fantasy purposes, because if Dak Prescott's throwing to those guys, he's going to be as good as Deshaun Watson for fantasy. And then we could have Deshaun Watson somewhere else. Well, sure, but I you're asking me like uh, I put words, out a dream scenario of where it would be Deshaun Watson could potentially Detroit. challenge to be the number one quarterback in fantasy if he's Dak in Dallas. Prescott could, could too. They both could, right? Like put that put yeah, that's fair. somewhere else. They both. Why do you hate Dak Prescott? Yeah, why? Well, do you, and Dak Prescott can't go to a different team and be a good fantasy quarterback there. He has to play in Dallas. If Dak Prescott goes to Denver or something like that, or maybe Indianapolis or San Francisco, San Francisco would be outstanding for Dak Prescott. I think we'd still hold Dak in pretty high regard. Yeah. Well, that's favorite. Yeah, my I, would, favorite I would love call. any quarterback to go to San Francisco. Do you want one that's a little more realistic? No, I want Heath to go now and then, then okay. back to the. I've got a combo deal. Let's send Jameis Winston and Chris Godwin to reunite in Indianapolis. That's they, not bad. They have no number one wide receiver right now. They have no quarterback right now. Let's bring in the duo. Maybe have Dirk Cutter come in as a quarterback's coach. Um, and uh, and we'll just get the band back together. 650 pass attempts, 5,000 yards, 30 interceptions. All good. Okay. Uh, that That's good stuff. And we will – where do we want to see Aaron Jones go? Let me ask you that. Where do you want to see Aaron Jones go? Well, I think the best destinations for a running back at this point would include like Atlanta. Um, I think Pittsburgh, if they decide to move on from James Conner, would be an appealing destination. Seattle clearly wants to keep running the football. They just don't like making big splashes in free agency or the draft to necessarily do so. When they did do it in the draft, it didn't work out so well. And Buffalo has also talked about being a better running team. So if, if the best running backs end up going to those towns, they, they would have an opportunity to do well. Aaron Jones in Atlanta could be a lot of fun. There's a better track record lately of wide receivers changing teams than running backs. Uh, I'll get into that in a little bit. Let me promote a few things for you. Uh, well, the biggest sporting spectacle of the year is, of course, upon us. And we know everyone loves making their picks, no matter if you're a diehard fan or you're just tuning in for the big game. So we think that you are going to love the opportunity uh, to enter CBS Sports football props to enter that game for your chance to compete for the $1 million jackpot. All right, props are fun. 
Just answer some questions. It's all free, by the way. And you can get a million dollars. If you correctly answer all of the questions, um, that's right. You're eligible for a million dollars and uh, guaranteed $50,000 to the winner. You can win all that money without risking anything. Just go to cbssports.com slash props or download the CBS Sports app to enter. The link is in the episode description. cbssports.com slash props or download uh, the app to enter. And you can also watch Super Bowl 55 on cbssports.com or on the CBS Sports app on your phone or connected TV devices or with your CBS All Access subscription. So if you're looking for a way to watch the game, Check it out online, cbsports.com. Check it out on the app. Check it out on All Access. News and notes. The Chiefs have two players on the reserve COVID list. One of them is Demarcus Robinson. These are players who are close contacts, so they still are eligible to play in the game if they continue to pe- test negative. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's not a huge deal with Demarcus Robinson, but maybe. Well, Kilgore is a, is a potentially significant deal. The center. Yeah, so obviously they have a bunch of um, they don't need more offensive line issues. Right. So, all right, we'll keep an eye on those. But in terms of DFS, I guess that's where I was going with that. If if Demarcus Robinson is out, Dave, what would that do uh, for Hardman or Watkins? Or I, guess I think Watkins is already going to be a pretty interesting play for DFS just based on the fact that he'll come back. Everybody remembers what he did in the Super Bowl last year. This is the type of game where veterans will get a lot more attention than you know younger players um i I think watkins will probably end up being in a lot of dfs lineups okay and we have a dfs special with mike mcclure who is a dfs whiz that will we're going to record it today and publish it tomorrow uh the other news items gm brian gutenkunst for green bay hope i said that right he said he'd love to re-sign aaron jones and they continue to say in Green Bay that Aaron Rodgers is going to be back as their quarterback. And meanwhile, the Athletics' Jeff Duncan said that New Orleans tight end Adam Troutman could have a big season if Jared Cook does not return in 2021. Yes. Heath, yes. where do you have uh, Adam Troutman in your dynasty rankings? I don't know if you have that offhand, but maybe generally, where do you have him? Well, I'm actually updating all dynasty rankings this week. Running backs came out on Monday. Wide receivers coming out today. Tight end will come out tomorrow. But he was sitting at 18 in the most recent update. I would not be surprised if he's a spot or two higher than that. But there's not like that's that's right about where I would have him for a guy that hasn't yet done anything. Uh, Robert Tunyon or Adam Troutman in Dynasty? Troutman is three years younger. But I would like I had Tunyon 15 and Troutman 18. I would guess that they will be in similar ranges, right? Right, very, very close to each other, though. Cool. Well, I want to tell you all about Lightstream before we talk about free agency here, uh, because it, you know you might be paying way too much interest on your credit cards every month, uh, and you should consolidate. Okay, get a consol- uh, credit card consolidation loan. Con- uh, consolidate your credit cards into just one payment at a lower fixed rate. Start saving money, and it's easy with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. Rates start at just 5.95% APR with auto pay and excellent credit. 5.95%, that is much lower than the national average interest rate on credit cards, which is over 18% APR. You can get a loan with no fees. That loan can be from $5,000 to $100,000, and you can get your money as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a better loan experience. That's exactly what they deliver. And hopefully you've heard about Lightstream, but if you haven't, you know, they, I know they, they're on other podcasts and whatnot. This is a really good service that can really help you out if you need to lower that credit card rate and if you're dealing with some debt. So uh, check out lightstream.com slash FFT. That's L-I-G-H-T. S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash F-F-T. Get a special interest rate discount and save even more. So there's that great APR. And now with lightstream.com slash F-F-T, you get an additional discount. Again, check it out. The only way to get the discount is at lightstream.com, L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M, lightstream.com slash F-F-T. Subject to credit approval, rates range from 5.95% APR to 19.99% APR. Include a 0.5% auto pay discount. Lowest rate requires excellent credit. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash FFT for more information. All right, let's go back to 2020 and the free agents that were on the move and the trades that were made. And Tom Brady. 
It actually was a pretty good year for players who changed teams. Tom Brady was QB seven. He threw 40 touchdown passes, did some great things for the Bucks offense. You also have Phillip Rivers go to the Colts, Teddy Bridgewater to um, Carolina. They were QBs 18 and 19. How about the wide receivers though? Stefan Diggs traded to Buffalo. DeAndre Hopkins traded to Arizona. Top four wide receivers in PPR. You had Emmanuel Sanders, who was okay. Um, Robbie Anderson had a good year, 1,100 yards, three touchdowns, 95 catches. Uh, the running backs, not as good. David Johnson was actually uh, 15th in non-PPR per game, 17th in PPR per game. It was an interesting year for David Johnson. Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon finished as a top 13 running back, believe that or not, believe it or not, but um, about 20th per game. Matt Breida and Jordan Howard in Miami. I'm not sure if I forgot any names there, but those are the, the big ones that came to mind. So the wide receivers were really good. Uh, the running backs, not so much. And the year before, Le'Veon Bell to the Jets, no. Um, but Mark Ingram to the Ravens, yes. So you got a bit, bit of a mixed bag. Uh, do you think that for the most part with free agent running backs, you'd actually rather they just stay with their team? Like, Do you, do you get kind of nervous, Dave, about a running back going to a new team? Yeah, you, you have to. Um, and last year, especially, you might have been nervous just because of no offseason program. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen this offseason, what type of a program teams are going to have, but I'm sure they'll have something. And hopefully the veterans will be able to understand what they're being asked to do and hit the ground running when training camp starts versus being exposed to like a whole new system and everything one month before the season actually begins. Would it be Because I think the one name you did forget was Todd Gurley. Um, there, would it be yeah. wrong to say that all three of those veteran running backs exceeded expectations last year? No. Yes, it would be wrong. Wait, which ones? David Johnson, Todd Gurley, and Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon. Oh, I think we had pretty high expectations for oh, Melvin. I think they were all, and he finished top fifteen. He finished thirteenth. He I've was, got him at fourteenth in PPR. Like, I, but he wasn't a top twelve running back being drafted. He was a nope. He was twentieth points per game in non PPR, twenty second in PPR, and when Philip Lindsay played, he was a sit. I think Melvin Gordon was a bust. I think Todd Gurley would, was a bust, and I think David Johnson was not. I don't under like no. maybe hmm. Gurley, but like Gurley also. In it's, we look at these things in different ways, obviously. But Gurley was like the number eight running back in fantasy the first half of the year. And completely useless, got benched in the second half of the right. Year. So he gave you, and I don't remember what he was—a fourth round pick or a fifth round pick or something. Um, maybe my perception of what their cost was is wrong. No, I, I think Gordon was like late round. I mean, why don't I just look it up? I think Gordon was like late round three. Gurley right, was. He like, was in that like top four. Gurley was. Gurley range. was going before him. I think Gurley was mid round three, then Ugh. Gordon, and then David Johnson was probably around five. So Johnson outperformed. Gordon was basically what he was drafted to be. And Gurley was a bust because of the second half. Johnson was actually more consistent than Gordon. Remember, Johnson played 12 games. Gordon played 15 games. So just by the nature of overall fantasy points, Melvin did have the chance to get more. But Johnson had a higher percentage of games with 15-plus PPR points than Gordon. Oh, Johnson was, was, was a good pick where he was drafted last year. I think so. And I know yeah. that he was frustrating for the first three months of the season, but if you had him on your team and you made the fantasy playoffs, I mean, his weeks 15 and 16, he was awesome. Well, uh, girl. So the way I have it now, like when we did the running back preview in early August, maybe it was more closer to mid August, um, Todd Gurley, Melvin Gordon were the first two picks of round four, or first two running backs of round four. Then it was Jonathan Taylor, then Le'Veon Bell, then David Johnson, then James Conner at that point. And they were all round four picks. Uh, so Gurley and Gordon were like early round four, Johnson late round four. But these are 12-team leagues, so, you know, 40th overall. And there were like, I think if I remember correctly, I think there were 20 running backs being drafted in the first three rounds. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. What the hell is the Sesame 16. Street? 16 running backs off the board in the first three rounds at that point, at that point. Right. Now, for uh, for us, Todd Gurley was definitely a third-round pick in the drafts we did. Not for us necessarily, but in the drafts that we were in. Um, Melvin Gordon probably was too, so Jonathan Taylor may have snuck in. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I, I guess it does depend on how you look at it, where they finish, but the journey of getting there for Gurley was so interesting because he was very reliable first half of the season, and then, I mean, com completely useless 
second half of the season. Johnson consistently worth starting. And then I, I don't know. How do you evaluate Melvin Gordon's season? I don't even know if this is relevant to today's conversation. Hmm. How do you evaluate? Well, but he Melvin could, uh, the Broncos could move on from him if they so choose, but I, I think his cap number isn't so bad that they, you know, and I don't think he was so bad that they do move on from him. They might be able to get one more year out of Melvin Gordon. And he started off. Okay. He had 14 plus PPR in three of his first four games. And then, you know, he had that DUI incident and I think that slowed him down a lot. And I think that took him off the field a lot. And he, he was okay down the stretch. I don't think anybody was jazzed to have Melvin Gordon. But on Dave, fantasy what did game. you say? He had three of his first four games. He was good. Philip Lindsay got hurt in week one and missed the next three. Mm-hmm. That's what I was saying. When Philip Lindsay played, Melvin Gordon really was not someone you could rely on. Sure. I, un- unless you thought that he had a chance to score or catch a bunch of passes. And that was, you know, a crapshoot every single well, he, week because the Broncos were weird offensively. Was Lindsay hurt at the end of the, the last five games of the season? Yeah. Yeah. Not all of them. Um, he missed the last two. Because he had like week 13, a monster performance, and then he was 11 PPR points, and then he was 12 PPR, no, 12, 24 PPR points. Like, he was pretty good at the end of the year. Yeah. Adam, there yeah. was only one game where they both had 10 plus PPR. So usually it was. Well, One like, or zero Broncos running backs were good for your good for fantasy in a given week, which I mean, of course, it was going to be that way. You couldn't count on Lindsey and Gordon to be good in the same week very often. They well, like didn't I have said, good matchups he like was, that. He was 20th per game in non PPR and 22nd in PPR. So not just not very good. But, um, you know, look, is James Con- is sorry, is Aaron Jones right now? better than Melvin Gordon was a year ago. And if Aaron Jones changes teams. Yes. Okay. Because he's a big, he's not a, with green Bay, not a huge touch guy. He's really benefited from being in a good offense, scored a lot of touchdowns, Mm -hmm. you know, and do you can, do you worry about that? I mean, well, he really benefited from from being wildly efficient too. I mean, it's not just the touchdowns. It's never 5.5 yards per carry. Like white, white PC for life. That was what this past year average 5.5, uh, 5.5 as a rookie, 5.5, his second year, 5.5 last year. He has one year where he did not average 5.5 yards per carry. He also had nine games with at least 15 carries in 2020. So I think he can handle a solid workload and he's caught 49 and 47 passes. Like he doesn't quite, he can do that too. 50 mm-hmm. range, but he's uh, a very, very, a- very active in the passing game. He's a he's a he's a very good one a running back. I don't know if a team's gonna uh, if the Falcons get him, are they comfortable making him their only back like they tried to have Gurley be at the beginning of the year? Well, my guess I, is no. I think that he, there will be a complimentary piece with Aaron Jones no matter where he is. I, I don't know because it's Arthur Smith now. Like if yeah, Arthur Smith he's decides not Derrick Henry. Well, if Arthur Smith decides I'm going to that my big free agent acquisition is I'm going to go spend $10 million a year on Aaron Jones. Then I think we should expect that he's going to be a, a feature running back. If they spend that much, then maybe so. I just, we talked about this on FFT and five. I believe that like, just because he had Arthur Smith had Derek Henry doesn't mean that he's always going to have, you know, the, the philosophy of you need a bull as a running back. I think he's adaptable. I think that's the one thing that we saw from Arthur Smith is that he can take what he's got and make, you know, chicken salad out of it. Yeah. I'm not trying to disparage Aaron Jones. Uh, He was this year, 10th in carries and 11th in catches among running backs. And he finished fifth in 2019. He was 15th in carries and 14th in catches among running backs. And he finished third. Is that on a per game basis or is that overall? Overall. So I'm just saying he's outperformed his touches because he is efficient. He also mm-hmm. does score a lot of touchdowns. Last year, he scored 19. Well, when I say last year, I'm talking 2019. So I'll right. be more specific. 2019, he scored 19 touchdowns. 2020, he scored 11 touchdowns in 14 games. I don't think that's disparaging. That's like disparaging him would be that he finishes below where he gets in touches. Yeah, all right. You're complimenting him. I, I, was, I was. No, I was just saying, well, I was saying he benefited from being on Green Bay a little bit, but he is. I, I think he's terrific. I think he's awesome. Um, I just don't want to see him go to a different team. However, if he does stay on, on Green Bay, you do have the A.J. Dillon factor. So it's Yeah, I, I think it's, it's more like I understand why you're saying that. I think his efficiency is helped by the Packers, but I don't think, and this could be wrong, I don't think that ne- it's necessary that any other team that goes and gets him in free agency is going to limit his touches like the Packers have. 
there are organizations or coaches who would like to have a feature back. If he landed with one of those teams, I don't think he's getting the number of touches he's getting because he's Aaron Jones. Yeah, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be so great if he were back on Green Bay. The way they were using their running backs in the playoffs, you know, they down the stretch. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they will get AJ Dillon more involved. Um, just he does seem to have a good thing going there with the Packers, and he is awesome. Uh, all right, I, I'm sorry to jump around. Let's, well, why don't we, we might as well stick with the running backs? You got Chris Carson in the mix. Um, do we still think he's got good football left? Cause this guy's productive. You know, he's, he finished, uh, he finished 16th in non PPR 20th in PPR, but he dealt with some injuries. He only played 12 games and per game, three straight years. He's been, uh, well, no, not even per game. Uh, yes, no, it is per game. Uh, three straight years. He's been 11th to 14th in non PPR and 13th through 16th in PPR. So he's been, a high end number two or a low end number one running back three straight seasons. Heath, do we think Chris Carson has, has a lot left or what, or another good year left? I I think it's solely dependent on where he goes and how they want to use him. Um, I've not seen anything from Chris Carson that suggests that he's lost skill or isn't good. Now we have seen plenty from Chris Carson that suggests he may not be a 300 touchback that can last 16 games. Um, So that is probably the bigger concern, but if he lands in a place where he's expected to be a lead back, I'm going to view him as a high end number two running back. I just don't know. And with, with everybody at running back outside of Aaron Jones, I am very concerned that they are not going to land in a place where they're getting a feature role. Okay. Dave, if there is one other player other than Aaron Jones that you think might still have a, another really good top 12 season left in them. Carson, Drake, Connor, Fournette, Lindsey, um, Bell, Mac, et cetera, Gurley. Who might Don't name it? Gurley? Okay. <laughs> it's Carson who, who did prove this year. He, he had 15 plus PPR points in half of his 12 games. I know a lot of people are going to say, well, that's not that good. Well, that was good enough to finish 10th in consistency at running back in PPR. So I think that is pretty good. Uh, the, the Seahawks had nine games where a running back had 15 plus PPR six were by Carson. Two were when Carson was inactive and one was when in a game that Carson got hurt and Carlos Hyde finished and had 15 PPR points. I, I think Heath nailed it. We, we can't have confidence in Chris Carson lasting 15 or 16 games. I don't think it's going to happen, but when he does play, He's proven. I believe he had a career high in yards per carry this year. I believe he also had a career high in receptions per game. So he's got those skills. Uh, he's always been a good runner as far as like efficiency goes. And I think receptions is something that's a little underrated with him. He just has to stay healthy. He could, he could also be a one, a running back like Aaron Jones, but he's got to find a team that really believes that he's that guy. He's 26 years old. I'm not outside of Seattle. I'm not sure there's a place where I would feel super confident in Chris Carson. Maybe we, could, if you put him in Atlanta or Pittsburgh, maybe that would work. But I, I think again, one, a type of running back who could be good for fantasy and might be overlooked a little bit. We know that we're going to take all the second year running backs ahead of him. He's going to be in that dead zone range of running backs, but he might be one that fantasy managers could say, okay, he's a good number two running back and he's going to give me some RB one weeks along the way. Okay, let's take a look at the wide receivers here. You got Galladay, you got Allen Robinson, Chris Godwin, Will Fuller. Will Fuller was a top eight wide receiver on a per-game basis. Uh, He was outstanding this year. Juju Smith-Schuster is the youngest. He's 24 years old. Uh, Corey Davis had a nice year. Antonio Brown, he is not the youngest. But, you know, Antonio Brown, you you might not remember because nobody pays attention to fit to week 17, but let me just get his numbers. He had a huge week 17 and it was 11 catches, 138 yards and two touchdowns on 15 targets against Atlanta. So there are some really good ones and that's not even the complete list. I do want to talk about one guy in particular, and then I'll just, I'll throw the floor to I'll throw. I'll open the floor to you guys. Um, Tower Lockett. It's hard. Like he's such a great combination with Russell Wilson. Wilson's mm-hmm. so accurate. Lockett catches everything. Uh, Lockett is so efficient, and so is Russell Wilson. I don't know. It's just hard for me to imagine Tyler Lockett on another team. Heath, do you think Lockett is a Russell Wilson product or a great wide receiver on his own, maybe somewhere in the middle? What would you think about him if he changed teams? 
Well, he's not a free agent, right? Correct. He's he's under he, contract. Potential for cap casualty. Oh, if the okay. Seahawks wanted to move on from Tyler Lockett, they could. But he's he's in a contract year in 2021 as it is. So they might just stick with him for one more year and then make a decision on his future after that. Okay, they I, could save ten million dollars on the cap. That's why I brought that up. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean they could do that, but I they're not replacing Tyler Lockett for ten million dollars. So, um. I expect he's going to be a Seahawk. Okay, so I guess we don't have to have this discussion. But you never know this year because the cap is going down. So right, you, no, that's true. I'm not saying it's we like, think it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, you, there could be some surprises this year. All right, then Heath, I'll right, open the floor sure. to you with the wide receivers. Um, what would you like to talk about? I think Galladay is really interesting because, mm-hmm. like, he has not quite quite had the 16 game season um, that like puts him in the superstar level where his talent and like watching him makes it seem like he is. And kind of the way I think we all feel about him and they are starting over in Detroit again for the 700th time. And he's not young. He'll be 27 at the start of the season, pretty much like not old either. So I don't, I don't like maybe it makes sense to franchise Kenny Galladay if he doesn't want to stay there. I don't know why he would want to stay there. And he could be an absolute monster in the right situation with a good quarterback as the number one wide receiver. What if you, what if Kenny Galladay and Deshaun Watson end up on the Jets? That would be fun. Yeah. Like he ends up with a good deep ball thrower. (laughs) in a decent offense, it'd be awesome. If he's with J- Jared Goff on the Lions when he kind of doesn't really want to be, I'm not sure how excited I'm going to be. Well, for Goff, though, he has produced a top 13 wide receiver three straight years um, but, on a per-game basis, top 23 straight years. You know, three seasons ago, he gave you three wide receivers that were top 16 per game. Cup played only eight games, but he... Uh, Robert Woods and Brandon Cooks were all per game top 16. So is he really that bad? I don't know that he's really that bad. I don't think he's the same type of quarterback. And we haven't seen it lately. So maybe Sean McVay's just been hiding it. But he, like everything we've loved about what Matthew Stafford has done since Bevel got there and the downfield throws, I don't want to see Jared Goff making those same throws. And my guess is that he won't make nearly as many. Right. Because, uh, I mean, it's pretty clear the Lions know that 2021 isn't going to be their year. Of course, their players are going to try and win, but I mean, the, the Stafford trade told you everything you needed to know. You don't trade away a franchise quarterback like that if you don't you know, think you're going to make the playoffs. So I'm, I'd be nervous with Goff and Galladay being there. Could Galladay still finish as a number two wide receiver with Goff as his quarterback? Definitely but I, I, I have a hard time seeing him as a top 12 guy. That whole offense is going to change, and my guess is that they'll be a little more conservative, a little more spread the ball around, and well, listen, the Lions coaches saw what Goff did. Is Goff a great deep ball thrower? Uh, I, and, I'd say no. I'd say no to that, and that's bad for Galladay. And Anthony Lynn does like throwing to those uh, short area targets. And loves backs. him. Loves throwing to the running backs. Loves leaning on the tight end making use of all the, the players that he has, and he's already got two really good options there. Goff in 2018, that was when he had... Yeah, that's when they went to the Super Bowl. His intended air yards per attempt was 8.7, which is not right. bad. I mean, it, this, this year was 6.6. I just want to compare that to Stafford. So it's 8.7 in 2018. For Stafford in 2019, it was 10.6, but it was actually 8.7 this year for Stafford. So exactly the same. Stafford's intended air yards per attempt in 2020 were exactly the same as Goff's in 2018. For what that's worth, the Rams offense has just changed so much uh, year after year, even with basically the same personnel. Well, and we've basically got like a year and a half of Jared Goff as an above average quarterback, and it was two years ago. Yeah. No, I gotcha. All right, so, so tell me this. As of right now, from a dynasty perspective... Who has more value, Kenny Galladay or Allen Robinson? Galladay currently, yes. Is that just because he's a year younger? I don't know that it's just because he's a year younger, but that, that's part of it, yeah. 
How about Chris Godwin, Will Fuller, Juju Smith-Schuster? Who's got the most value right now? Godwin, Fuller, Juju. To me, it comes down to either Juju or Godwin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Just because A, they're young, and B, they're very good receivers. And they can just play a long time. They've shown the ability to play 16 games without performance-enhancing substances. (laughs) Um, Like, that's not, that's kind of a joke, but it's not really, it's a, Fact too. Worth um, picking up. Yep. I've got Juju just barely ahead of Godwin, but that's, I mean, that's yeah. all because of it's weird. I don't think people really think of Juju as being younger than Godwin. Um, but that could very easily change based on where those two end up next year. Juju's 24 as, as of a month ago. Juju's 24, Godwin 25. Yeah. That's how old they'll be at the start of the season. Okay. So they're both, you know, about to hit their prime, basically. In, in their, if not in their prime right now, but they've got, if they're really great wide receivers and they've got a lot of good years left. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. And, and I guess the difference is like Juju's coming off two pretty disappointing years in a row and Godwin's coming off two really damn good years in a row, especially 2019. So how are we supposed to look at Juju Smith Schuster right now? I, well, I think it will be very interesting to see how the NFL looks at Juju. And where he falls amongst, because I think he like he's probably right there with Allen Robinson, the most likely to change teams, and maybe he's even more likely than Allen Robinson. I don't know, um, but it will be very interesting to see what type of contract he gets and what type of situation he lands in. Okay, Dave, let's take a look at the rest of the list: Corey Davis, Antonio Brown, Curtis Samuel, T.Y. Hilton, Marvin Jones, A.J. Green, Nelson Aguilar. Uh, Tim Patrick's restricted. Sammy Watkins is a free agent. Is there a name out there? Corey Davis, Antonio Brown, Curtis Samuel, Hilton, Marvin Jones, AJ Green, Aguilar, Tim Patrick, Sammy Watkins. Uh, someone that you could see a much higher interest in if they land in the right place. If they land in the right place, I mean, they almost all of them would be appealing for fantasy if they all go to, you know, if if they're the number two receiver in Green Bay, if they follow Deshaun Watson somewhere. Um, but I'm not sure how many of these guys are going to be in high demand. I do think that the league will see T.Y. Hilton as still a, a good commodity. I don't think he was – by the end of the year, I thought he was running pretty well. Uh, everybody remembers that huge stretch he had toward the end of the season when he was just putting up huge numbers week after week. I think he was just proving that he was getting on the same page and getting in rhythm with Philip Rivers by then and that he was all the way healthy by then. I know he's older and he's definitely an injury risk, but I think he does have some pop. And I think that a team like Baltimore that wants to stretch the field a little bit more could be interested in somebody like him. I think Jacksonville could be interested in adding even more speed to their offense. I know that Curtis Samuel does have a past past relationship with Urban Meyer. He could end up going there, but maybe T.Y. Hilton stays in the division and he goes there uh, to try and and make that offense a little bit more dangerous now that they're upgrading a quarterback. I wouldn't say that there's anybody here that has like top 20 receiver potential, but maybe in the right spot, Hilton could be there. And he's probably the only one that I would say has a shot if he just lands in just the perfect spot to finish as a low end number two wide receiver. Heath, any final thoughts on wide receiver and Corey Davis? Yeah, T.Y. Hilton and Corey. Maybe. I mean, what what would be that perfect situation for Corey Davis? Where he don't name a team. Think of it more like he's definitely going to be the number one receiver. Well, can he do that? Can he well, handle I don't think that? T.Y. Hilton's definitely going to be the number one. Receiver. I don't think he can either. Which is why I think at best he would be a low end number two receiver. Now we right. could probably say something very similar for Corey Davis if if he ends up in that spot. I'm not sure he will. I'm trying to know. do this quickly, just looking at it. But one thing I did notice about Corey Davis throughout the year, when Tannehill had those games where he threw, I'm looking at 27 or fewer times, Corey Davis usually was hard, was really bad in those games. He didn't need a ton of volume, but he needed like 30 or more from Tannehill. When, when you got down to like 24 passes, 26, 27 passes, those were usually the bad games for Corey Davis. And, and so he- maybe he just needs to go to a place where they're going to throw more. I mean, he could go to the Lions and they don't get Kenny Galladay and he's the number one wide receiver. He could go to the Bears and they lose Allen Robinson and he's the number one wide receiver. Those are teams that I don't expect are going to have a lot of extra cap money and could be losing their number one wide receivers. And he could be the 
consolation to the consolation prize. Dave, let's talk about uh, tight ends. Who are the top tight ends that we're looking at? So Hunter Henry and Janu Smith are both unrestricted free agents who could be on the move. I think Janu actually, you know, he played big in a contract year and he could get paid for it as a team tries to find, you know, that mismatch piece at tight end. Henry is a little bit better, I think, is like an all around tight end, whereas Janu is more of just like a receiver type. Robert Tunyon is a restricted free agent. My guess is that he'll stay in Green Bay for one more year. And then after that, the list is really ugly. Gronk, Gerald Everett, Dan Arnold, Jared Cook would be the names that are out there. Jordan Reed would be out there. And then uh, the guys that might be cut, cap casualties that you might be able to find, Zach Ertz, Eric Ebron, Tyler Higby. If the Rams want to just pull the trifecta of offensive players that they gave a ton of money to, and oops, we got to get rid of them. Higby could be on that list. Uh, Kyle Rudolph is going to move on. Jimmy Graham, if anybody wants you know, a guy with a six-inch vertical, he, he, he'll be available too. Um, so it's, it's not a great, great list once you get past Henry and Janu, but those two would be the prize. Uh, and that's excluding what's in the draft. Okay. Who's got more dynasty value, Hunter Henry or Janu Smith Heath? As of right now, I would still say Hunter Henry, but they're not, they're not terribly far apart. Um, and their situation could change that, but I just don't know. I, I love the athleticism and the big play of John O. Smith. Um, our friend Ben Gretsch used to say that earning targets was a skill as well. <laughs> and he's played in low pass volume offenses, but he set a career high last year with 65 targets. <laughs> I, I don't know that anybody, like somebody, I don't know anybody's going to prioritize him as like a big part of their passing game. He's never had a 500, 500 yard season. Well, they would see what he could do on film and say, let's give him more work and let's see if he can be that guy. No, they could. I I'm just saying, I think it's, it's pretty uncertain. Hunter Henry has been on pace for 101 targets and 106 targets in his last two seasons. And that's not going to set any records, but it's going to be, you know, somewhere near the top five. If you're about a hundred or 105 targets at, at the position. And unfortunately he has not, he has not been a top five tight end either of the last two years on a per game basis. He's been more closer to 10th uh, last year. He was 16th in non PPR 12th in PPR the year before that he was 10th in non PPR eighth in PPR. So he hasn't... seems a lot older than John o. Smith. Nope. He's nine months older. Right. right. Yeah. Um, all right. I don't know. Is there any other conversation you want to have about tight ends or should we? Yeah. Move? What's, what's the best destination for a tight end? I had a hard time with this one. Now, obviously, if the Chargers don't keep Henry and if the Titans don't keep Janu, those two teams would open up as being interesting spots. But I, I'll, I'll list some teams off. You tell me if you think they'd be eh or ah for tight ends to go to. So think about Henry and Janu going to one of these teams. Cincinnati. Ah. Uh, I think that's an ah, too. But <laughs> that might be the best of the ah. Seattle. I don't <laughs> think we'd love that. No. Uh, Carolina, I don't think we'd love that. Jacksonville? No. Yeah. Ah. There's one the, left you haven't said yet. The Jets? Yeah. Who, who am I missing? The Colts. They I can move Jack on from Doyle's, Doyle. I think he's the, and I don't, I think Moelle Cox and Trey Burton are both free agents. So even if they kept Doyle, they always have two tight ends. Not all. Yeah, and let, let's be honest. If they sign Hunter Henry or, or John Hugh Smith, it's to, it's to be the starter. It's to be a guy there. Sure. Right. right. Yeah. Not to be Trey Burton. So, uh, yeah, I guess it depends on who the quarterback ends up being for those teams. Right. So we're going to get Jameis and Chris Godwin and Hunter Henry on the Colts. And I, th- I do think the, that the Gronk thing is interesting because OJ Howard is under contract for this year. And yep. I think he, he can could do get everything too. that Gronk did this year. If Gronk doesn't come back, I think OJ Howard's a pretty sneaky sleeper for next year. Mm-hmm. So if Jameis Winston goes to the Colts and gets Chris Godwin and Hunter Henry, where are you, you going to rank Jameis Winston? Eight. <laughs> <laughs> he's not getting the top seven, but he's eight. Yeah, I think you'd have, to, you'd have to give him another shot. How about st- In that scenario, Jameis has Godwin and Henry. Would you go Stafford or Jameis Winston? Oh, Jameis, for sure. 
Has Stafford ever had a good as a year in fantasy as good as Jameis's best year? Maybe one. I think he finished top five like once, but probably in- didn't score near as many points. Uh, maybe not, but thirty interceptions that brought those points down a I little. I do bit. not care. You know what? Uh, let's find out. Okay, I just I'm, look- I, I'm looking. I, I'm glad that you're putting him in Indianapolis, but I think the Colts made it pretty clear that they're going to prefer to be a running team moving forward. Okay. Like, gonna find this maybe they'll be balanced. 363 points is what I have Jameis for in 2019. 423 for Stafford in, tw- in 2011. Oh, wow. Okay. No, he yeah. had 41. I knew he had one on like phenomenal interceptions year. and 5,000 yards. Damn, that's a hell of a year. Mm-hmm. Wow. That was 10 years ago. Yeah, he had 20 touchdowns the following wow. season. Okay. Uh, so that brings us to quarterback and Jameis Winston. Is is he the best quarterback that other than Deshaun Watson? Is and James, Dak? They, Remember, Dak, Dak is technically a free agent. Like, I don't they, think he is, but technically, he's a free agent. Yeah, they, I mean, they've been pretty explicit. They are going to bring him back, but sure, maybe, maybe not. Um, all right, is Jameis the best free agent though, other than Dak? I think so, but I mean, it's a byproduct of who's available. Line up Jameis Winston, uh, 27 years old against 32 year old Cam Newton, or 38 year old Ryan Fitzpatrick, or 33 year old Andy Dalton. I mean, it just makes sense that Winston is going to be the most appealing of that group. Actually, I did want to make a point about Cam Newton. So he he rushed for 592 yards and 12 touchdowns in 15 games. You have to be a pretty bad passer to not be a top 12 quarterback if you rush for 500 yards and he rushed for about 600 and he was, I mean, look, he was obviously a bad passer, but he also, um, he also wasn't that like 65.8% completion rate. It was the second best of his career. He threw 368 passes. Like that's ridiculous. That's the lowest of his career other than 2019 when he played two games. So I think we all watched Cam Newton and I'm not going to sit here and say he was good. But like they're, that is the worst personnel in football. With Julian Edelman out, I can't think of a team that has worse receivers oh, than no. New, New England. And he still rushed for 600 yards. So he, if he even gets decent receivers and a team that's willing to throw the ball a little bit, you know, they were so run heavy. I don't know. I, he could be a sleeper, maybe in a two QB league, a sleeper that could finish top 12. I don't, he doesn't have number one upside anymore or anything, but you know what I'm saying about cam? You feeling that you feeling me? I feel you. Mm-hmm. Woo, feel it. I think about him in San Francisco and that's a team that again, innovative. They like to use the talent that they have and they'll use them to the best of their ability. And I'm sure that Kyle Shanahan could find a way to make cam Newton work in that offense. They don't throw downfield a ton. They do it from time to time, but that's a, you know, it's a West Coast offense that's run first. I would think that Cam could be useful for fantasy in that type of an offense, but I also don't think that the 49ers are looking at him and saying, well, we got to get Cam Newton and get rid of Jimmy Garoppolo. And that's the, and that's the problem is that you're, we're, we're staring down the barrel of a really good draft class at quarterback and teams already two teams have made a deal with changing quarterbacks around. Like, where does Cam Newton find a job at this point? I think it's going to be hard for him to do that. He should go back to Carolina. You know, Washington, Washington has a, a oh, coach yeah. that knows him and doesn't have a quarterback. Well, they have Alex Smith. You know who should, uh, who was the most productive quarterback other than Dak that's going to be a free agent it was Ryan Fitzpatrick. This guy was a must start when he played, he's a free agent. He is. Yeah. I mean, if the Dolphins want to make the playoffs, I should probably keep him. <laughs> um, all right. Well, that's a, that's a look at free agency. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we've got uh, just a few questions to read. Emails, Apple Podcasts. We'll be right back on Fantasy Football today. Thank you very much for your Apple Podcast questions. Please leave us a five-star review with a question. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, question, I uh, don't know who the author here, but dear Tommy, Johnny, Joey, and Dee Dee, I don't know. Yeah. Eight team. I mean, is it Rugrats? Eight team dynasty league. I have the first pick of the rookie draft. 
Should I trade Devontae Adams and pick 101 for Stefan Diggs and Jonathan Taylor? Hmm. I'm kind of inclined to take that deal to get um, Diggs and Taylor. <laughs> the Ramones. <laughs> it's the Ramones. I said Rugrats. Well, close. You were really close. Yeah, yeah, the Ramones. Okay. Uh, that is interesting. Adams yeah. and pick 101 for Diggs and Jonathan Taylor. I would, man, I've got, I was just looking and I, I'm going to update the trade chart this week, but my last update had Adams and 101 worth 56 points. And Diggs and Jonathan Taylor worth 56.3. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. All right. It's a, you can definitely do it if you want. It's a very even trade. Emails from Mitch, fantasyfootball.cbsi.com. Super Flex League is Matthew Stafford. That's cool. Uh, trade George Kittle. Get Cam Akers and Dallas Goddard. Would you give up Kittle for Akers and Goddard? Goddard. Yeah. And this is probably a keeper league, right? If you're making trades in I February. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're getting off the Kittle bandwagon and you're getting a second year running back and a tight end that could be very useful for fantasy for the next several years. I think you make this deal easily. Yeah, I would. I would make the deal. I, I think Kittle's the best player, but I think Goddard makes up for the difference. Okay. From Peter. Where's he from? Long Island, New York. You a little more specific. Roslyn. Hey, okay. Uh, Gray the Trade Dynasty Superflex. Dear Verbal Dean Fenster and McManus. I know this one. You guys know this one? I feel like I should know this one. Verbal Dean Fenster McManus. Give me the keys. Uh, Usual suspects. Come on. Mm. Gray the Trade Dynasty Superflex. Alvin Kamara and Russell Wilson. Giving up Kamara and Wilson. Oh, you better get something good. Again, a lot, a lot of good if you're giving up Camara. Get Justin Herbert, DJ Moore, Antonio Gibson, and a first round draft pick. <clears throat> Would I do it if the first round draft pick were the 101? Oh, yeah. I think I, 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 think I would. Pick, you know? Yeah. I mean, Wilson definitely isn't the hang up in this deal. It's Camara. I mean, in a dynasty super flex league, you'd rather have Herbert than Wilson, right? Yes. So you're getting an advantage there. And so it's Does Kamara. more Gibson and a first make up for Camara. Well, if it's a one on one, I Gibson, think you're doing it. More and a first for Camara? Right. Yes. But what if the first is 112? I'm I might take I think I'd still I'd still take the deal because I I think I would almost I think I would take Gibson Moore and 112 for Camara and I'm also getting the benefit of having Herbert over Wilson. All right, that's it for today's show. Thank you to Heath. Thank you to Dave. Thank you all for listening. Oh, Ben Schrager too. Thanks Ben. And all of you for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow on Fantasy Football Today. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.